and welcome to Take Time. I'm your host, Patrick Marlette, and let's talk about my watch collection. This is honestly the most requested video I receive on a daily basis here on the channel, and I'm very flattered you all want to see what I typically wear, but I don't, I don't generally like SOTCs, and I'll, I'll, there's two reasons why. One, I don't generally find SOTCs that entertaining as a viewer. I don't watch them, but I know a lot of you do, and I see a lot of channels with hyper-popular SOTCs, so there's clearly a following for it. And since you guys want it, obviously I want to provide that for you. So what I'm going to do is reformat this SOTC thing for you. I'm going to make it almost solely about why I made these buying decisions as a collector, unless you know, trivial factoids about the watch. I may throw in a story or two if the watch deserves it, but um, I think the buying decision is the most important aspect of these SOTCs and will hopefully help you uh, from an informative standpoint on making better buying decisions. And two, I am very biased when it comes to how I make purchases. So let me just get those things out of the way. If, in case you guys don't know, if you've never watched the channel before and this is your first video, maybe watch some of the backlog. You know, about a third of the videos are about watches, about a third of the videos are strap reviews, and about another third of the videos are vlogs or interviews. But um, if you haven't gathered yet from any of those videos, I am, I'm a Seiko collector. I solely collect Seiko watches. So don't be too shocked when you see my collection and notice that it's all Seiko. I am a Seiko enthusiast. I, I only collect Seiko, and I have a particular interest in late 60s, early 70s Seiko. So I expect to see some of that mixed in with some modern timepieces. And as a lot of you know, I have a personal belief that everyone should have at least one Omega in their collection. I, I really love Omega's styling and I really like their history. And my own personal history with the brand has led me to that conclusion. So of course you're gonna see one Omega and you guys might know which one that is. Uh, but there's also another philosophy I want to share with you. And, you know, again, everyone has different philosophies on collecting. But one of my major ones is spending within my means, you know, not pushing the credit cards and, and buying something that you can economically and soundly afford. And right now, I sort of cap my watch purchases at a thousand a piece because I generally believe you can find a great watch under a thousand. I mean, an amazing watch. You can find a great watch under 500, but you can find really amazing timepieces under $1,000. You needn't spend any more unless you're looking for a grander complication, what people would call hot horology. Um, you know, you're gonna go way, way well into the thousands. Uh, you know, it, it's those, those timepieces are on a different level. But if you are a casual consumer like myself, I think my SOTC is going to appeal to you because I don't buy outlandishly expensive watches. It's just I'm not in the financial state to do so. Um, New York State uh, taxes me as if I was a middle class guy. So I'm a middle class consumer. So if you are a middle class consumer, your, your collection could look like mine. And there's nothing wrong with that. And that's, that's one of those things with SOTCs, you know, Everyone's collection is going to look a little different. Some people have a checklist of things they want. Maybe they need a, a, a compressor diver or they need a world timer. I don't feel that way. I am almost purely about the watch's aesthetic and then the mechanical ingenuity and then any of the other trivial things that go into play. But when I look at my watch on a regular basis, I really want to enjoy the experience of, of taking in my timepiece. So uh, without further ado, I think we're, we're good to step into this SOTC. Now, the only real question is, do I want to start you guys off with my vintage pieces or my modern pieces? So as a collector, I have another personal habit. I, I maintain six modern pieces and six vintage pieces at any one time, like a one in one out policy. Um, I don't want to go over 12 watches. I think that's that's madness. And um, I have a roll bag where all my vintage pieces go. And in some of my earlier videos, you would have seen the roll bag in the background. And I have a display box with all of my modern pieces. But before I go into any of those, I actually think I want to talk about two watches that I've purchased strictly for the show. So one of those pieces is in front of me right now, and this is a railroad approved, I believe this is like late 80s, maybe maybe mid 90s. I genuinely don't know much about the Seiko. You know, I didn't research it that much. All I, all I knew about this particular model is that it had a 20 millimeter lug width. And the watch behind it, this Vostok, this watch had a 22 millimeter lug width. 
And as you guys know, I review a lot of straps on this channel and I have so many straps come in that I need to have watches to cycle strap options on. So I've got you know my regular collection of watches where I'll wear interesting straps that, that I personally enjoy and or pieces that I'm reviewing. And then you know I have these guys that are dedicated to just having a new accessory on them at all times. It's one of those things I have to do uh, for the channel. So, you know, I bought this piece and I bought the Vostok solely for that purpose. I don't really count them as part of my collection. It was sort of a sort of a business expense for the channel because you know, there's no way I can arguably get enough wrist time with all of these straps if I didn't have a solid rotation of watches for them. So 20 and 22 are the common sizes that I feel like you or I uh, have on our timepieces. And that's generally the size range, the lug width size range of a lot of these brands. So that's why I have these two time pieces. But this guy's incredibly accurate, by the way. Um, I, I, I wish I did know more about this. Maybe, maybe one of you guys knows more about the railroad approved, uh, the movements inside these guys, but they're, they're pretty phenomenal. So yeah, so far as why I bought this watch and that Vostok, I'm not, yeah, yeah, this Vostok is, God, it's so, it's, so I bought this also to review, you know, a lot of people go gaga over Russian watches. I personally uh, had a mini collection of Russian timepieces when I started getting into watches. They're very affordable and there is a lot of interesting designs. And again, that's sort of my bag. I, I enjoy well-designed timepieces, but modern Vostok, not good. I had a vintage one, a vintage amphibia just like this with the uh, paddle hands so much better and the proportions were better and the steel was cut right um i'm gonna do a review of this watch i think it deserves it but uh, because there's so many it's uh, Vostok is always relevant particularly with how much they cost you know it's a great entry level mechanical watch for anyone an automatic mechanical watch for anyone with not hacking but hand winding so very very cool stuff this piece again uh, strictly for that 20 millimeter lug width Moving on, I think I want to start with my vintage pieces first. They, they are the more interesting of the lot in, in my book. And um, these are all going to be Seiko. So surprise, surprise. If you like Seiko time pieces, then you'll enjoy this segment. If not, then maybe you get to learn something new. So as many of you know, I don't typically like dress watches. This is not a dress watch, okay? This Grand Seiko, not a dress watch. This is a dress watch though. This is the dress watch in its purest sense. As a matter of fact, this is the king of dress watches. So what I'm holding in my hands right now is the King Seiko 44-9990. So there's the 999, which is the earlier iteration with a pretty janky hacking mechanism. There was a lever arm on the outside of the movement that stopped the gear that held the seconds hand. Um, and this is bad because that lever always broke. And then they internalized a very similar mechanism for hacking this watch that was much better. Uh, this is sort of a transitional period for them because it still has the Seiko Shield crest, but it does have, which is on the older models, and then they moved to just the Seiko text on the later ones. Uh, this has the modernized movement, but the Shield crest on the back. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, you know, that's, that's one of the reasons I bought it, just as a collector. I like uh, nuances like that. I like seeing interesting uh, tidbits, something that tells me something about the watch when I'm buying a vintage watch. But also, I don't, again, I don't generally like dress watches, but this has made me reevaluate my opinions of dress watches across the board. You know, I was just setting it to that 10-10 that look you see in all the catalogs. Um, but yeah, this watch reevaluated my opinion of dress watches in general because it is just so gorgeous. And truth be told, I'm I don't I'm not always participating in activities that cause a great deal of sweat or make me plunge into massive pools of water. So it doesn't really matter if my watch is water resistant to a certain extent. So you know, on on a casual everyday basis, a dress watch is acceptable. And I'm sorry, guys, if you hear pipes clanging in the background. I live in a very old building here in New York City and I don't control the heat. So when it kicks on, it, it, it kicks on. It's about 15 degrees here in New York while I'm filming this and it's snowing outside. So 
they've got the heater running. So th that's what the noise is. It's not a neighbor knocking on the walls. It's just these old pipes. So this particular model was produced in 1966 and you see a lot of the same hallmarks in Seiko's dress watch design from this particular watch carried on throughout their entire range to date. As a matter of fact, when we look at my Grand Seiko, you're gonna notice those same sword-like Dauphine hands, those thick slabs of steel featured on my Grand Seiko as they are featured here. Really, this, this dress piece is a complete marvel and anything that causes me to rethink how I collect is truly spectacular. There, there's very few pieces that I've acquired that have made me have made me reconsider why I buy watches. And this is one of them. This is definitely one of them. It's changed my opinion about dress watches. It's also helped me better understand like the composition of a watch and its, its case design. Um, I don't wanna go too far into detail. I'm gonna review this piece at a later date. I think it definitely deserves it, definitely warrants it. But this is a second generation dress watch from the group and it's one of the most beautiful dress watches I've ever seen. So if you couldn't tell from all my gushing, I really like dress watches now. That one is absolutely gorgeous. I think the design language that was developed into producing that case, not only the case, but the dial and the handset uh, were among some of the best of Seiko's design catalog ever, you know, just ever. So if you want a beautiful dress watch, maybe you should look into one of those. They're still about sub $500, which is fantastic. By the way, like like I mentioned off the bat, all of my watches are within that $1,000 range except for one. Um, and I'll get into why I, I made that purchase later, but next piece. So in my hand right now, I'm holding a 4006 6027 Bellmatic. And this is the most impulsive purchase I've ever made. Uh, there are two that are, are sort of tied with each other. They're both vintage pieces from me. Um, but this is this is one of them. I found it complete with the original warranty card, the box, the papers. The only thing it's missing is part of the outer box. It used to have a blue lid uh, with the Seiko branding on the top. I do have the bottom half, which was in gold. Um, that That's neither here nor there. It didn't really matter to me so much. I just like the fact that I was able to acquire this watch for well under $300 and this impeccable a condition and it, it operates like brand new. So honestly, the major, it's so funny. I mean, I haven't worn this watch in a while and just taking it out of the roll bag, you can see that the automatic movement here is already fired up. It's, it's so good. Um, yeah, you know, the Bellmatic series has been on my mind for a while. Every single series of Seiko has its own separate following. And I think that's what's really interesting about the brand. You know, there are people that purely collect Alpinists. There's enough of those to just collect Alpinists. There's people that purely collect tuna cases. There's people that purely collect Bellmatics and they're a very passionate group. And by no means is this a real rarity or oddity from that lineup of watches, but it is my favorite case design. I love the um, blue uh, accent ring around the, the bezel that holds the glass into the case. I love the chiclet case design and I love the flat link bracelet it originally came with. This is of course an Uncle Seiko bracelet I'm wearing right now. Um, I have the original bracelet tucked off to the side. They're both spot on. I mean, th this one looks just like the original. So this is pretty much the aesthetic that you'd see this watch um, come in. And this is actually, uh, I've seen some catalog illustrations of this watch. This is a North American model. Um, there are different bracelet options that came with this. This was my favorite bracelet option as well. So very, very happy coincidence. But again, this is a very impulse buy for me. Uh, you know, one, I, I would not recommend doing this unless you've done your research, but I, I did not do my research. I just knew I had wanted a Bellmatic for the longest time and my favorite one came up, so I had to get it. And, you know, my thought was if it was a real mess, I'd take it to my mechanic. Luckily, it wasn't, and it works so, so well. Um, I've been wearing it for the, the month I got it. I wore it pretty much the whole month, and uh, I just haven't worn it in a bit. I have a lot of watches, so I don't get around all of them, but this one is really, really spectacular. And the, the bell function, it, it chimes. The, what you're really looking for with these Bellmatics is the, the chime. The chime was supposed to alert businessmen or anyone who has a tight schedule to keep, you know, uh, I need to answer my phone and call this person now, or I've got a meeting at such and such time. It's just to alert you to certain reminders you should be uh, taking in through your day to day. Uh, it's not going to wake you up from a deep slumber, but it's such a cool, quirky function 
that I, I really love it from this brand. Of course, this is also gonna get a full review. I know some people have asked to see this more in depth, but right now, impulse buy, not much else I can say about that. This is a piece you've seen featured on the show. I have gone over a thorough review of this watch. Um, it is one of my favorite chronographs, and it's honestly one of the most gorgeous watches in my collection. So right now I'm holding my 6139 6005, and this is the other impulse buy. However, I'd done a bunch of research on this model. Um, I knew what exactly I was looking for when it came to this uh, particular watch. This is not a Pogue, it's not a true Pogue. It looks very similar to Colonel Pogue's watch, but it's not. I'll leave a link to the video so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, I do discuss what makes a true Pogue in that previous video. This is a very, very close, um, you know, iteration to that watch. It's got the honey yellow dial, the yellow indicator ring, and then that classic Pepsi bezel. It's an absolutely stunning automatic chronograph. One of the first ever production model automatic chronographs ever produced. And it's an absolutely gorgeous timepiece from Seiko. I wish they would do a reissue of some of their early chronographs from 60s, 70s. They're, they're amongst some of the best watches they've ever produced, in my opinion. And that's sort of what led me into collecting Vintage Seiko. Just the, the sheer number of options you can find. This is such an iconic timepiece as well that... And th there's a lot of them out there, but I feel as, as a collector, if you're interested in getting a Pogue or a 6139, this is the one to get. It's definitely going to rise in value. I, I don't feel it's going to drop at any point. It's just so gorgeous and so significant in a horological sense that, you know, if you wanted to make a safe bet with your money, this is a good way to go. But also, if you just want a fun timepiece to wear, this is one of the best. Yeah, and, you know, it takes that fun category and skyrockets it to the moon. Like, it is such a joy to wear. It's so fun on the wrist. Like, I've never gone out and not had someone point it out and say, that's a really gorgeous watch, because it is. And you know my vanity, I'm really looking for people to compliment it. What I'm really getting at is that it's just so fun and funky that um, you you are sure to enjoy it. It is such a delight. Random people do, I do, and you likely will too. Holding in my hand right now, I have what is honestly my favorite watch. This is, I, I, I worked so hard to find one of these in as nice a condition, and this is pretty awful shape. Honestly, and not a lot of you would probably not want this case in this shape. However, it to me is absolutely beautiful. They're, they're hyper rare. It's, I barely ever see these pop up. But in my hands, I'm holding the younger brother of the 6139, the 6138 0011. So what makes this watch so special to me? Well, <laughs> what's funny is I owned a 0017. I still own a 0017. Uh, and that particular model... Uh, had loom on the hands in the dial, and you'll notice that this watch doesn't. I'll get into that in a second. But when I picked up that original watch, it was the first watch that my girlfriend stopped me and said, that is such a beautiful watch. And I'm like, wow, wow, there's a watch that changed my girlfriend's opinion. She could care so much less about this hobby, and this is the one watch that's actually got her attention because it was so outlandish and so just incredibly cool. Uh, it was it was enough to garner her attention, and I thought, well, you know, that is clearly a special watch. There's something about the roulette subdials on this timepiece, and the just the overall configuration with the case and the tacky scale, that bright red ring uh, surrounding the glass on the bezel insert. It's a magnificent watch, and it's absolutely my favorite. Now, why I own two of these? Uh, the 0017 again had loom on the dial. And it wasn't cracking or fading or anything like that. And I do enjoy a nice patina, but I wanted this version. And I wanted this version because this thing is future-proof. Now, a lot of the 6138 chronographs, it doesn't matter what the case model is, there are five sports speed timers and there are speed timers. And amongst those variations, there are JDM-specific models that have no loom applied to the dial or the handset. It's completely future-proof. And what I mean by that is, the more I wear this in the future, the likelier it is that, you know, the, the loom on my watches is going to crack and or fall off, you know, sun damage, all that other nonsense. This handset is pristine. The markers are still painted that beautiful pristine white. 
as I, you know, it was originally created, crafted. I, of course, replaced the crystal and I cleaned off the dial a little bit. But um, all in all, this is completely original and it's absolutely stunning. And it's going to look this stunning for as long as I own it. And uh, that to me was worth picking up a second one. Um, I'm actually on the hunt for a whole host of 6138 models. I love the speed timer variations. That goes without saying. And all of the ones I want are the ones without loom. Um, so I'm actually looking at a 0040 is what the bullheads are called. I would love a brown bullhead five sport speed timer, no loom. Um, I like the idea of my watch being future proof. I'm always really, really uh, paranoid about loom falling off my watches. It's, it's kind of a silly thing, but it does matter to me. And this is going to retain that sort of beauty that, that captured my girlfriend's opinion and mine when I first received it for the rest of its life. So that's awesome in my book. God, I'm so sorry. This video is taking really long. I, uh, should, uh, should I make it a two-part video? I think I might make this a two-part video. That's that's maddening. I'm sorry. I really hate uploading really long videos. I, I would rather these be, you know, one-time consumables, but it's not working out that way. Um, yeah, you know what? We're gonna we're gonna do this in two parts. I think it's fair that vintage got its own day. And all, all, my, all my babbling um, about my vintage timepieces. That was it. I have two more timepieces coming in the mail. Um, I just want a watch that I'd been trying to hound down for a solid year at this point. And I finally found an amazing example. And then there's another watch that was an impulse buy. They're both vintage timepieces. But there's a little hint I'll give you for the other timepiece. It is one of the first Seiko watches to ever feature a snowflake dial. And I doubt it's one you've seen before. So I'm very excited to have that. It's, it's probably, it's not a watch that warrants its own video, but you might see it in passing. And I'll be sure to illustrate it in the future. But guys, if you liked part one of this SOTC, let me know in the comments down below. I feel like such a jerk to keep you waiting, but I don't want to leave you with a 40 minute video. I can see from the recording times that I'm taking entirely too long to talk about my watches. That was not my intention. But I'm going to do a briefer look at my modern timepieces in the next video. So hang on for part two. But if you like this video, feel free to hit that like button. It looks a little something like this. If you've watched the channel for quite some time now and aren't a subscriber, what is wrong with you? Go ahead and hit the subscribe button while you're down there. That way you can see the rest of my collection and you get to see all the other fun vlogs, interviews, reviews, and discussions on this channel. I like to incorporate a lot of your thoughts and your comments in future videos and how I produce content. So also feel free to comment when you're down there. That's one of the ways that's best to communicate with me. If you wanted to have a one-on-one, -on -one, I'm generally pretty good of responding to individuals that comment on the channel. So feel free to comment with any future concepts or things you'd like to see, if there's an interview you'd like to see, yada, yada, yada. Again, my name is Patrick Marlette and thank you for the time.